In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a prayer from the book In Sinu Yesu, which means in the bosom of Jesus. In the bosom of Jesus, in Sinu Yesu, when heart speaks to heart. And this prayer is, Lord Jesus, thou askest not the impossible of me, for even when thou askest what to my eyes appears impossible, thou art already making it possible by grace to thee and to those who love thee. Nothing is impossible. I can do all things in thee who strengthest me to do them. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. St. Alphonsus, pray for us. Here is a quote from St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. The aim of taking a retreat is to advance in the knowledge and love of God, to purify ourselves, and to reform and transform our lives according to the life of our model, Jesus Christ. It is a time of greater silence, of more fervent prayer, of special penance, and more intense spiritual activity. It is not so much looking back on the achievements and failures of the past as looking forward to a more generous imitation of our Lord himself. That's Mother Teresa of Calcutta speaking particularly to her sisters, but it applies to all of us. And on this feast of St. Alphonsus Liguri, uh, we know that one of his primary counsels in the obtaining perfection in the love of Jesus Christ, the very first maxim is to desire ardently to increase in the love of Jesus Christ. To desire ardently to increase in the love of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. And so the focus of this retreat is belovedness as your essential identity. Because that's the essential identity of Jesus himself, who is the one eternal high priest. And priests are ordained into Jesus, the one eternal high priest. Jesus in the Trinity is the beloved. St. Alphonsus, or, you know, is a great teacher of the importance of the love of Christ, but all the saints are, such as St. Augustine, who in teaching about the Most Holy Trinity, the interior life of the Trinity, basically speaks of the Trinity as being lover, beloved, and love. The Father is the lover, Jesus is the beloved, and the Holy Spirit is love. And that's the interior life of the Trinity. That's what we're going to be going deeper into, especially as we enter deeply into St. John's Gospel, chapter 13 through 17 on Thursday. But it's all about love. God is love. And belovedness is our essential identity. And Jesus knew this about himself, and this is made evident in scriptures when we see that the Father spoke three times in sacred scriptures. The Heavenly Father spoke three times in sacred scriptures. First, at the baptism of our Lord. We know our Lord did not need to be baptized. He was baptized for us. But also, there was the important aspect of John the Baptist and others seeing the Holy Spirit come upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And then the Father spoke, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. My beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. 
And then the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert to do battle with the devil, our enemy. And that battle continues. The second time the Father spoke from heaven was at the transfiguration. Again, the Holy Spirit present in in the cloud. Jesus, whose face reflects the glory of the Father, and that's why we'll spend time in adoration of our Eucharistic Lord, beholding the radiance of the Father's glory on the face of Jesus and feeling the intense love between the Father and Jesus and Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. But at the transfiguration, we hear the Father again say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Again, belovedness is at the heart of it. The third time before Jesus goes into his passion, Jesus prays that the Father glorify his name with the glory that he had before he came into this world, right? And the Father says, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. What does he mean by that? Well, there's many levels to it, of course. There's the essential glory that Jesus, as the eternal word, the eternal Son of God, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, enjoys with the Father from all eternity, and he came to make that glory manifest. But also Jesus glorified the Father in the incarnation when he was emptying himself, though he was in the form of God. Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself and took the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. He was known to be of human estate, and it was thus that he humbled himself, obediently accepting death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God highly exalted him. And chapter 2 of Philippians goes forward from there. But the having glorified it is the incarnation. Jesus assumes our human nature, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. One of the important things we'll be going into during these conferences will be the importance of having that relationship with the Holy Spirit and Our Lady, because wherever there's the Holy Spirit and Our Lady, there's Jesus, right? And so that's, that's also emphasized in this in sinu Jesu. Uh, I like to call it a gift rather than a book. Okay, but I have glorified it and will glorify it again. He will glorify it in the Paschal mystery as Jesus glorifies the Father and the Holy Sacrifice, the Mass. And we will go deeper into the the Holy Sacrifice, the Mass as well during this conference. So we have these three times the Father spoke in sacred scripture. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Right? And this is very instructive to us. The importance of being beloved. And to know the Father's love. If only we knew the Father's love for us and the the predilection that the Trinity has for his priest and religious, uh, but especially his priest in, in desiring to be intimate friends. And he wants us to be priest after his own heart. So our identity, in fact, every person is, is called to come to this identity. Our identity is as the beloved, and this was the choice of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from all eternity. We are not what we do. We are not what people say about us. We are not what we have. We are the beloved. We are the beloved. And if we can really take that into our hearts, this whole retreat is worth it. Let me share that in every retreat from all eternity, the Trinity has prepared graces particular to that retreat, and they will be placed in your soul and blossom at the right time. We ask Our Lady and our guardian angels 
to seal those graces for us ahead of time and protect those graces. We are the beloved. If you know yourself as the beloved, you will not be deceived by the enemy who will try to tempt you to identify yourself based on what you do or what people say about you or what you have. You can even look at the temptations of Jesus in the desert to confirm that the enemy will try to use these deceits of identifying yourself with what you do or what people say about you or what you have when you look at Jesus' temptations in the desert. Right after the Father spoke, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert. We know from sacred scripture of three of the major temptations, we know that Jesus faced every temptation that mankind would face and he overcame them all. And the battle was vicious. We should not be shocked by the struggle and the battle that face us in bringing souls to God. It says, in fact, in Scripture, brace yourself for temptation. So let's briefly look at the three temptations of Jesus that we know of from sacred Scripture as he went to the desert and see how the enemy is going to try to deceive us and, and will try to deceive those we serve. So the first temptation, you are what you do. And, and notice that the enemy always says, if you are the son of God, if you are putting you on the defensive, prove yourself, prove yourself. Jesus knows who he is, so he doesn't fall into the trap. But if you are the son of God, change these stones into bread. Show who you are by what you do. Change the stones into bread. Jesus knows he's the beloved. He doesn't need to change the stones into bread. He doesn't need to prove himself by what he does. Remember, all of you are priests forever in the order of Melchizedek, those who are ordained in the priesthood, and you are the beloved. And, and don't be deceived. It's not what you do that makes you a priest. Yes, in response to God's love, we're supposed to be generous in serving God's people, serve as Jesus served. He came to serve, not to be served. But our identity is as the beloved. So please don't fall into the trap of identifying yourself with what you do. If someone has a gift of preaching, if they lose their voice and they're ordained as a priest, are they still a priest? Of course. We're beloved time and time again in this, in this gift of Insinu Yesu. You, you, you hear Jesus speaking from the heart about his love for his priest. He wants to be intimate friends. He wants us to spend time with him. In fact, you look at the call of the first disciples who became apostles. And it says that he chose those he desired to be with. That's the first thing it says. He chose those he, who he desired to be with. Then he formed them. But he desires to be with you, especially in Eucharistic adoration. And he desires this for all the priests of the new and eternal covenant. So, we are not what we do. The second temptation... We are not what people say about us. The devil took Jesus to the top of the parapet of the temple and basically said, jump off the temple and the angels have charge over you. He manipulated the, the psalm. It's kind of uh, something that uh, instructs us that we need to know scripture better than the enemy. The enemy knows scripture. We need to know sacred scripture and the sacred tradition better than the enemy and know the unchanging magisterium of the church and help people know it. Although I always smile when I read the full psalm because it says that you will tread on, you know, the lion and the viper, right? <laughs> the, devil, the devil knows that psalm well 
because the, even the exorcist in the time of Jesus would use that psalm to cast out the evil one, so he knew that psalm well. But he tried to get Jesus to jump off the temple because what was happening, while all the people were gathered there at the temple for worship, and if Jesus would have jumped off the temple and levitated and showed who he was, everybody would have bowed down. Whenever there's a great display of power, remember the, all the miracles that God worked to deliver the chosen people from the Egyptians? But what happened shortly after that? They forgot, right? They get out to the desert and they forget all of that. You know, signs and wonders aren't enough to know your identity especially. And so if Jesus would have jumped off the top of the temple and levitated, people would have bowed down and worshipped. He would have shown who he is in a certain way exteriorly, doing an act of sensationalism. And we live in a time where people want sensational things. They're driven by their senses. Sensationalism. And if people speak well about you, if you jump off the temple and you levitate, everybody's going to speak well about you. You do sensational things. People will say great things about you. Is that who you are? Or are you beloved? Your beloved. Technology can be used for many good purposes, including in evangelization, the new Oropagus, to reach the whole world. But at the same time, if we lose sight of the fact that we're beloved, sometimes we might be driven by how many views we got on YouTube when we gave a teaching and how many likes we got. And we get hurt when there's a dislike. Well, remember, Scripture says if you speak the language of the world, they'll love you. But if you don't speak the language of this world and you say, my kingdom is not of this world, what's going to happen? You're going to get crucified, right? And so uh, we're in a time when we live in what they call the cancel culture and Pope Emeritus Benedict said we have to really pray against that because, frankly, it's even entered the church where sometimes priests who are speaking the truth in season, out of season, convenient or inconvenient, which is what we're supposed to do, are getting canceled. But we're not going to go there. We're going to focus on being beloved. But part of what we're doing here as well is we're making reparation for priests who have lost sight of their identity as the beloved. Because when you know you're the beloved, you're not going to fall into these traps of the enemy. And you're going to be able to speak the truth in season, out of season, convenient or inconvenient. And know that it brings you to those words of the Father. <laughs> I have glorified it and will glorify it again. We, we enter that glory in our baptism, but... We enter into that glory deeply with each and every communion with our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity, really, truly, and substantially present in the Most Holy Eucharist, but also for those who are ordained in the eternal high priesthood of Jesus Christ. What, what a glory. What a sharing in the glory of Jesus Christ. But that means we're going to the cross. We know that. The church is going to the cross. The bride of Christ must go where the bridegroom has gone. And the priests of the new and eternal covenant, sometimes I'll say priest, but our founder, Father James Flanagan, God rest his soul, a very holy priest, um, you know, he used to urge us not to just say priest because priest is kind of an identity of what you do, but a priest of the new and eternal covenant, that's who you are, a priest of the new and eternal covenant. We are a sacrament. We're a living sacrament. That's who we are. We're beloved. Beloved. And the whole world wants to be beloved, and we'll get into this some more, but let's not fall into the trap of it's what people say about us. Because if your identity is in getting applause, and you're getting a lot of applause, that might mean you're too friendly with the world. <laughs> we all have to examine our conscience. A retreat is also a time for a reform of life, right? And so hopefully we, we take away a reform of life. So 
Jesus knows his essential identity as being the beloved. The third temptation, we are not what we have. The devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and said, if you bow down before me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. We have to pray that the people we serve don't bow down before idols and don't take the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell food. I know it'll be tough, but we got to be willing to die because even if all the kingdoms in the world are offered to us, so what? We're not what we have. We are the beloved. We are the beloved. And let's be real. Life is short and we're all going to die. Life is short, death is certain, eternity is a long time. (laughs) And so, God willing, when we're in heaven, and we bring many with us to heaven, remember St. John Vianney, the, the patron of all priests, said if the priest is holy, the people will be good, right? And if the priest is good... The people will be mediocre. But if the priest is mediocre, the people will be bad. And if the priest is bad, the people will end up in hell. Well, (laughs) we need to really resolve to be holy. But God willing, when we're in heaven and the people that we serve are in heaven, we're not going to be doing things that build up or break down our egos. We're not going to be known for what we do. We're going to be in the presence of of God and we're going to be beloved. So let's get people focused on that. But first, we need to have it. We can't give what we don't have, right? Belovedness, belovedness, belovedness. In heaven, it's not going to be what you do. Yes, we do good works. We respond to grace. And and, and in the end, it is about grace and charity. And there is such a thing as merit. Our Blessed Mother had the most merit of any human person ever and ever will. And so there, there is the teaching of the church about merit. And good works are very important, extremely important. What good is faith without professing it and and putting it into practice, right? Faith without works is dead. But we're not identified in what we do. We do because we're loved, just like Jesus did because he was loved. He knows himself as the beloved. So in heaven, you know, There's no building up or breaking down of our ego based on what we do. In heaven, we're not going to be having people saying good or bad things about us that uplift us or discourage us. And he even even on a practical level here on earth, my brothers, if you're anything like me, how is it that you might serve hundreds or thousands of people at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass on, a, on the day of the Lord, and yet you remember the, the two people who said something negative about you or didn't say something to you or didn't, you know, affirm you. How is it you get locked into, you know, a negative thing based on something someone says? Let's remember it's a privilege to serve. And as St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, we're called to be faithful, not successful, right? Faithful, faithful, faithful. So why is it one criticism among a thousand compliments can cut right to the heart and overwhelm us? That might be a little bit of an examination. Remember, part of this retreat is going to be to reform. But don't focus on this. Let's focus on the positive, the positive. I've... You know, I I found in the church, we actually have a very uh, fruitful approach 
in teaching virtue ethics now, in, in, in having people strive to grow in virtue, to strive for the positive instead of trying to work on the negative, to be aware of your predominant fault, yes, but then to strive for the virtue that would overcome that predominant fault. That, that, that's been very beneficial to people now. You know, you fast from, from the negative thing and you feast on the positive thing. Fasting and feasting go together, but you make more progress by focusing on the positive. But remember, the ultimate positive is the cross. It's a plus sign. It's a positive, right? <laughs> and so that's where, that's where we live. That's where, we, that's where our Lord rules from the cross. But in heaven, you know, we're just going to be praising God and his goodness and, and not be caught up in, in being uplifted or discouraged based on what other people say about us. And then in heaven, we're not going to have anything. We're going to have everything, but we're not going to have anything as far as, you know, material possessions, thank God. And I have never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse in my life. I don't know, maybe somebody has, but I haven't. So we're not what we have Brothers, we're beloved. And so let's not live a life of ups and downs based on the lies of the enemy. It has to start with us. Part of the whole Insinu Yesu gift is the Lord speaking heart to heart about the relationship that we're called to. And then if the priests have this relationship, the priests of the new and eternal covenant have this relationship, then you can give it to others. But if the priest is caught up in what they do or what other people say about them or what you have, well, the people, they're going to follow. And we need them to be free. Interior freedom. St. Ignatius of Loyola, we celebrated, well, Sunday was his feast day ordinarily, but interior freedom, holy indifference, to be free to discern God's will, right? To come to that purity of heart. Because with God, everything is possible, right? And that, that's also part of it. The Lord speaking heart to heart will come to many passages. The Holy Spirit will lead you to many passages. But the Lord keeps keeps trying to speak to our hearts. Let me work in you. I can make things fruitful. If you rely on yourself, you're going to be sterile. Sterile. As a matter of fact, today's saint, St. Alphonsus, wrote 111 books on spirituality and theology. But one of the quotes I'd like to share with you from one of his writings is this. He who trusts himself is lost. He who trusts in God can do all things. St. Alphonsus Liguori. He who trusts himself is lost. He who trusts in God can do all things. Today's gospel, the multiplication of the fish and the loaves, right? The people came to Jesus, 5,000 men, not counting women and children. If you took an equal number of women, there's 10,000, and then children, you know, 20,000, 30,000, nobody knows what's the exact number, but the point is... Uh, with just a couple fish and five loaves, the whole crowd was fed and satisfied, prefiguring the Most Holy Eucharist. It is providential that right now, uh, at this retreat center, the seminarians from the Archdiocese of Kansas City, Kansas, are here with their beloved Archbishop, Joseph Nauman, and... Uh, I had a chance to spend some time with him. And I asked him some advice. And the thing that struck me was when he shared with me that 
I, many times I feel like the little boy who just had, you know, the two fish and the five loaves. I just, that's all I can offer to God. But when you offer to God and you let him work, when you're in a relationship, look what happens when we, we offer our little bit, right? And even God gave us that little bit even. But God will work for those who have faith. But if we're caught up in what we do or what people say about us or what we have, we're going to get in the way of God working. And so keep your eye on heaven. Remember the second reading from this past Sunday, you know, focus on things above. For Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He is God, but he, he is there at the right hand of the Father. And the Father and Jesus sent forth the Holy Spirit to help us receive that love of Christ poured forth in our hearts. But our identity is as the beloved. And so, we are hoping that during this retreat, we live a life that radiates and expands in the knowing and Believing in the love God has for us. We pray that our, we live a life that radiates and expands in the knowing and believing in the love God has for us. In fact, the beloved disciple, St. John, is going to be a real model for us. Okay, Jesus is the model, the beloved son, right? But it, all of you who have gone into the gift of Insinu Yesu know that the priest who was sharing this journaling with our Lord asked for his soul to be Johannanized, to have his soul Johannanized, because St. John is the beloved disciple. And so we are actually given a great model in St. John. We'll be going into this more in these conferences how St. John is the one who placed his head on the heart of Jesus at the Last Supper, the beloved disciple. Heart to heart, in Sinu Yesu, in the bosom of Jesus. But St. John was also gifted the Blessed Virgin Mary, as all of us were gifted through St. John, the Blessed Virgin Mary, when Jesus said from the cross, woman, behold thy son, and then son, behold thy mother. So John the Beloved is really the one who's going to teach us the importance of having a relationship with the sacred Eucharistic heart of Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary, a concrete living example of a saint, a bishop, the Beloved disciple, who we can really relate to and, and learn from how to relate to the heart of Jesus and the heart of Mary. And that's what this is about. It's about belovedness, but this belovedness is being beloved, the beloved of the Father, of course, and teaching the whole world how to be the beloved of the Father, like Jesus, to be baptized into Jesus. In him we live and move and have our being. But to really draw from the example of St. John, the beloved disciple, how to have that relationship with the heart of Jesus, the sacred and Eucharistic heart of Jesus, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And to let Mary teach us how to go deeper into that heart. Because when she stood at the foot of the cross after being given John and us as her sons, eventually after that moment, the Lord taught some more from the cross, praying for all of humanity. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he prayed the whole psalm about gathering all the nations together. But then he said, I thirst, and we'll go into this, having that thirst radiate in our souls to satisfy that thirst, like Our Lady, through loving trust, total surrender, and cheerfulness. And then it's consummated to complete our mission in Jesus on earth. And then, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. There's a whole spirituality. If you live that your whole life, 
In every moment of your day, if you said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, that's a strong spirituality. But then the heart of Jesus, it says in Scripture, was opened. Opened. That word was chosen precisely by the Holy Spirit to reveal that the heart was opened. But Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, is the one who understood that mystery of divine love the best of any human person. And later she taught John when John took her into, her, into his home, right? And so we'll learn a lot from John. I'm just laying a kind of a framework for the whole retreat here now. But we've, we've covered a lot of things. At the heart of this first conference is belovedness. During this retreat, we'll also allow God to heal us. Be open to the healing. And I would actually suggest that many of the hurts, many of the wounds we have, and remember, we're all wounded healers, but many of the wounds we have are because we bought into the lies of we are what we do, we are what people say about us, or we are what we have. And so many people in the world are wounded because of this. But we'll go more deeply into that later. The focus this evening is just being grateful for the gift of belovedness. And so I urge you all to spend much time letting God speak to your heart in this gift of Insinu Yesu. You'll be given this little booklet that has references to the, some pages that will be very helpful in topics in the Insinu Yesu. But of course, sacred scripture, I'll go more into that tomorrow, from the beloved disciple St. John, from the prologue to, we'll go into chapter 2, the wedding feast at Cana. <laughs> uh, but then uh, other parts of St. John's Gospel, but of course, as was noted, Jesus has asked his priest in particular to prayerfully reflect on St. John's Gospel, chapter 13 through 17, every Thursday. But then chapter 19, that Jesus on the cross, and we have the gift of being given the Blessed Virgin Mary as our mother, and also hearing the thirst of Jesus for souls. But in the letters of St. John, the beloved disciple, we're told this is love. Not that we have loved God, but God has loved us first. So another thing I would ask you to reflect on this evening, in addition to belovedness as your essential identity, is to always seek your first love. Seek that eternal love. We love him because he loved us first. Never lose sight of that. He loved us first. He loved us first. And he made love visible in assuming our human nature and going to a cross and leaving us the gift of the Eucharist. And our hearts will only be satisfied in this love, this created love, this creative love, this redemptive love, this sanctifying love, this life-giving love, this healing love, this first love, God himself. And so, the essence of this evening's conference is your essential identity as the beloved, your essential identity as the beloved, your essential identity as the beloved, not in what you do or what people say about you or what you have, and seeking the first love. Always seeking the first love. Remember in Revelation, Jesus even said to the church at Ephesus, you know, I have this, this against you. You've lost sight of your first love. We, 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 we can't grow cold, and we'll go deeper into how in, in the Insinu Yesu, Jesus is wanting us to become adorers and reparators, making reparation for the priest brothers who have grown cold or indifferent or have been distracted by what they do or what people say about them or what they have. So, I always like to just 
Keep it simple, even though there's a lot of words. And brothers, I'll share with you. Keep praying for me. I'm tired of hearing myself talk. <laughs> the, the Lord has much more to say in the Eucharist, and just being in his presence is, is more, more valuable. But I'm here as a facilitator. The main point this evening is your essential identity as beloved. Jesus knows his essential identity as the beloved. We're ordained into him. Where at least there's, there's brothers here that are or baptized into him and consecrated, deepening that baptism. But for the priests who are ordained into him, you know, we are the beloved. And hopefully we hear, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, if we keep our focus on the first love. So... Let's be open to what is prepared for us from all eternity. And let's pray for each other. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.